It's good to see you, Venture. Those of you that I've got eyeballs on and I'm looking at right now in the room, it's great to see each and every one of you today. Those of you who are joining us online right now, it's great to have you with us as well. I want to dive right in. I wonder. Um, you know, it's common this time of year at the beginning of a new calendar year. Oftentimes we pick, many of us, as we think about goal setting, we pick a one word, kind of a Look ahead toward the year. What's the one word I want to live up to? What's my word of the year I hear people asking? I got to thinking about that uh, this past week, and I was thinking, what would happen if you did that kind of looking backwards? If we looked back at the last year that we just walked through, many of us, all of us, what would be the one word that you would choose? One word to encapsulate this era that we've been living through. Well, somebody might go with the obvious word, maybe the word pandemic. Somebody might pick a word like fear. Maybe somebody would pick a word like sickness. Maybe you'd pick a word like politics. What word would you choose? Maybe some of us this past week, we'd pick a, a, like a string or a phrase of words. Maybe Bernie Sanders memes would come to the top of the list. I mean, it's been fun the last few days if you've been surfing around on the internet. If you ask me to pick one word to look backwards over this last era that we've just lived through, I don't know if I could boil it down to one word, but definitely inside my top ten list. This word's probably going to surprise you, and I'm going to have to explain it to you. Here's my word. Pottery. What? What? What's that have to do with anything, Stan? Well, for me and for my family, that word, pottery, well, this has been a year of pottery in the Killebrew household. Let me explain. As I'm explaining, I want to show you a video. This video is a one that we actually shot. By we, I mean, well, I'm on this side of the camera. You're looking at my lovely wife Dawn's hands there. This is in our master bedroom. You know, maybe your house is like this as well. Our master bathroom has got one of those giant garden tubs, you know, that nobody ever uses. And uh, we bought the house, oh, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago. When our kids were tiny, we'd throw them all in there and they'd get a bath together. But once they got old, old enough to where that got to be weird, we stopped using that tub. It's kind of been a collector for dust since then. Well, Thursday night, Dawn did this in that bathtub. It's become our pottery studio, if you will. And she's been having some fun all through this pandemic. Or actually, that pottery wheel was her Christmas present this year. But it didn't start there. It started back way at the beginning of this era we've been living through. She had rented a pottery wheel, and we put down a tarp in the living room during that kind of lockdown era, the quarantine era, era that we all lived through. Uh, and the kids had fun learning how to throw pots on a pottery wheel. Here's some pictures to illustrate what I'm talking about. Here they are, right there in the middle of the living room, making a mess, and it was beautiful. Let me show you the finished product, what they what they turned, what they produced. This is a picture I snapped on Thanksgiving Day. That's kind of a charcuterie board, some fancy meats and cheeses. And these pottery pieces, well, the kids and Dawn turned those, notably missing from this display or any pots that yours truly have produced. Turns out this is not my special talent. My contribution to this display, well, I know how to run a chainsaw, so I sliced a log for that board that it's sitting on there. I want to show you in real living color some of what has been produced. It didn't begin just during the beginning of the quarantine time, but rather we've been doing a little bit of pottery in our house for a while. I'm going to come over here. This is the marvel of live TV. Let me see if I can show you. Oh, yeah, looky there. Good thing I clipped my nails this morning, right? What you're looking at here is a piece of pottery that one of my kids, I believe my youngest, made for me years ago. And what you're looking at right here, this is a pencil. And for years, this sat on top of my desk, and it was really just for show. I didn't have a heart to, I didn't want to use it because I didn't want to, to ruin it because it's such a cool piece. So they've been playing with pottery for a while. But in living color, let me go ahead and show you what they've been producing this year. These are cool. Not just throwing pots, but learning the art of glazing. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that cool? You see speckles in there. This is one that my youngest, Jake, produced. And he's got a real knack for glazing pots. You can see his name signed right there on the bottom. And the date, 2-4-20, right at the beginning of that weird era that we've been living through. Pottery. Okay, so you didn't come to church for show and tell, right? 
So hold on to that thought. What does pottery have to do with the passage that we're studying today? Well, I've titled this sermon, Courage for Conflict. Courage for Conflict. This is week four of this series we're calling Encouraged. We're seeking to grab some courage, pull courage out of this passage in 2 Corinthians to encourage one another to put courage into each other. So, you might want to go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I've kind of primed the pump, so to speak, with this pottery uh, metaphor. You can see if, you're, if you want to go there right now, if you can't wait, you can go and see what this is all about, why we're talking about pottery today. It's been a historic week, though, right? I mean, my goodness, we celebrated the peaceful transition of power that our country is built on, one of the bedrocks of our country. Then the week ended with Bernie Sanders memes. We all enjoyed that, maybe a little bit too much. But the week began, if you think way back to the beginning of this past week, with Martin Luther King Day, MLK Day. I celebrated that day, that morning, by rereading Letter from a Birmingham Jail. I wonder if you've read that. I read it uh, this past summer. My, my family and I, we were in Birmingham. We happened to stop there on a road trip south, and it was kind of like grab a last-minute hotel. And we were downtown Birmingham just a couple of weeks after the George Floyd death kicked off all kinds of things across our country, including downtown Birmingham. But just as luck would have it, we were right there, and we were just down the street from the 16th Street um, church, that Baptist church that was bombed in the 60s, and the, the park right next door where water cannons were turned on peaceful protesters. Perhaps some of you lived through that era of history, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, we walked around, and it was that night that I opened up, and I searched it on the website, and I read a letter from a Birmingham jail. I reread it this past week. And then I started reading about the circumstances that happened with the writing of that letter, including... He wrote it, as I understand it, inside of a jail in Birmingham, and he didn't have, like, paper to write on, so he grabbed a newspaper, and he started writing this very eloquent letter in the margins of a newspaper. And then he grabbed tissue paper and little scraps of paper, and they ended up piecing this thing together by, like, a, a jigsaw puzzle. And then it got produced and sent out in magazines, and we're all reading it still today. It's possible that some of the letters of Paul... We're reading through and studying a letter of Paul, 2 Corinthians. It's possible that some of those letters were written just like that while he was in prison, including like the book of Philippians. There's a whole section of letters in the New Testament that are known as the prison epistles. 2 Corinthians is not one of them. This was written before that time period in Paul's life when he was in jail, but there's some tension that we're starting to grab. We're starting to see tension between the church and the culture at large. They're starting to live in some tension even at the moment he writes this letter. I want to show you this tension we're talking about. There's some conflict here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it begins and it ends referencing the tension. At the very beginning, he says, Therefore, verse 1, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. There's tension we're walking through, we're living in. Can you relate with that encouragement from a couple of thousand years ago? Maybe you're feeling that way today. Then at the end of this chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, I believe it's verse 16, he comes back to this same idea. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. There had to be some conflict that the Corinthians were walking through and that they were feeling. Why else would Paul challenge them not to lose heart? Why else would he challenge them to raise their eyes, their gaze from the temporal to the eternal? And it feels timely to me that today we should study this passage because our culture is feeling tension right now as well. We're divided. We're frustrated. I mean, the new presidential election, right? 
It did not deliver a mandate to our new president. We're still divided, deeply divided in the House and the Senate, and not just politically, but we're divided probably as a culture as well. Do you feel it? Do you feel that tension? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You probably feel it as deeply as I do. There's a good reason to study our Bibles, specifically 2 Corinthians, because I think we can grab some wisdom from this today. Actually, the Corinthians had an awful lot not to lose heart about. Corinth, the letter that Paul is writing to the church that's located in that city, oh, it was a major metropolitan area of the day. It was the kind of place that felt cultural tension. It felt political tension. It was located on a strip of land. It had water on both sides. It was kind of like a shipping lane. And, uh, oh my goodness, there was all kinds of cultural collision in that city, including religious ideology, different religions from around the world gathered there. Uh, There was um, political turmoil in that city as well. There were cultural issues in that area. These people were deeply divided There was a temple to Aphrodite, or maybe you know her as Artemis. She was supposed to be the goddess of sensual love and pleasure, and it said that there were 1,000 temple prostitutes that served in that temple right there in Corinth. In context then, uh, even in the morally corrupt society of the larger Roman Empire, Corinth was known for its excessive moral decay. Actually, the word Corinthian in the vernacular of the day was used by Romans for somebody who, well, had a lot of moral issues, right? The shipping trade that we just talked about had made people rich. Corinth was known in the day as the sin city, the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. Some were rich, but there was this deep chasm in that world between the wealthy and the not so wealthy. Does that sound familiar today? It's good to study this letter. The atmosphere and the context of the Corinthian church, what we just described, this is where this letter is being written to. And this bridges well with our context today as well. And so from this, I want to share with you straight from the text three encouraging challenges. Again, these are lifted straight from the text that we're studying today. Three challenges. If you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. Number one, be encouraged. Be encouraged with these words from Paul, and let's begin and let's end with your heart. If you want courage for the day, we probably should examine your heart. Remember, that chapter begins and ends with this message of the heart. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. We talked a bit about the heart last week, if you were here, if you joined us. If not, you might want to go back and check that out. In the Bible, it says, above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Let's get practical. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we do not give up on Jesus. You see this in the tone underneath the words that Paul is writing here. We don't give up on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus has not given up on us. And can I remind you, If you've asked Jesus to be Lord, you've also asked him to be Savior of your life. But as a Lord, you've invited him to be the boss. Our country. Our country just elected another president. But church, hear me. The church already has a king. If Jesus is your Lord, King Jesus is a higher power than any elected official. So, oh, put your faith Put your faith squarely where it deserves to be. We worship King Jesus. We do not give up on Jesus. He has not given up on us. Now, here's what we're not deceptive. The passage talks about this because in the middle of corruption, in the middle of decay, in the middle of this cultural mess, sometimes we can start cutting corners. We can start looking at things a little bit different. We can be deceptive, and Paul cautions against that. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What Paul is saying here is, listen, he didn't do things in secret. He didn't try to deceive others. When you give your heart, you have nothing to hide. 
Lead with pure hearts during this time period, church. Speak the truth. Yeah, speak the truth. But as the Bible says, speak it in love. Here's what else we do as we think about our heart. We shine for Jesus. The passage continues. Let's keep reading verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out, shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. As you're guarding your heart, constantly be asking yourself, am I really shining for Jesus in this moment? I would challenge you this week to think that through well. In this work confrontation that you're going to experience this week, are you shining for Jesus? In this social media post that you're getting ready to write, are you shining for Jesus? If the answer to that is no, well, then bite your tongue. Close your mouth. The keyboard that you type on, it has a delete or a backspace, depending on whether you're a Mac or a PC user. But it's got that little button for a reason. Don't be afraid to use it. The first encouraging challenge challenge is to begin and end with your heart. The second, the second challenge, if you're taking notes, write this down. Hold your treasure well. Oh, we're getting to, meet, to the meat of this passage. We started with pottery. Let's continue in this pottery image. Hold your treasure well. You have a treasure. Hold on to it. This is what he says in verse 7. Let's continue. But we have this treasure, there's our word, in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Let's talk about pottery. We started with that. Let's keep talking about it. I told you that pottery has been a big deal this last year in our family. Well, this metaphor is all through the Bible as well. The Bible, uh, the setting of our Bibles, rather, is an ancient land, and the book of Israel is teeming with archaeology. The most common artifact, if you go and dig around in the dirt in Israel, is what's known as a potsherd. I'm going to show you a close-up of that right here. If we can kind of zoom in on that, you can see it. You can even see the ridges and lines in there of where it was turned on a potter's table. I picked this up a few years ago as I was walking through Shiloh, an ancient location in the Old Testament. Think the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Think the tabernacle. Think where it would have sat for about 400 years before the Davidic dynasty began and the temple was built in Jerusalem. These things are everywhere all over the Holy Land. You find them as you start digging. It, they kind of transcend culture. You find them in wealthy spaces, the richest of homes and palaces. You find them in the poorest of places as well because pottery, well, this was, this was a big deal in the everyday life of ancient peoples, especially the people that we study in the Bible. So I've taken a deep dive into pottery in the Bible this past week. I want to show you a few places where this treasure that's talked about that we just read in jars of clay, earthen pots, this shows up all through your Bible. We find it in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. This is the message that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. I will give you my message there. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working with clay at the wheel. Don does that in our garden tub, bathtub. I bet he had more of a professional shop set up there. He was making a pot from clay, but there was something wrong with the pot. So the potter used that clay to make another pot. Hold on to that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. With his hands, he shaped the pot the way he wanted it to be. Then this message from the Lord came to me. Family of Israel, you know that I can do the same thing with you. You are like the clay in the potter's hands. I'm the potter. This is God speaking to his people. This message is from the Lord. There may come a time when I will speak about a nation or a kingdom that I will pull up by its roots or tear down and destroy it. But if my people of that nation change their hearts and lives and stop doing evil things, I will change my mind and not bring on them the disaster I planned. 
there may come another time when I speak about a nation that I will build up or plant. Isn't that interesting? Pottery was used as both a metaphor and a simile in that story, right? You're like the clay in the potter's hands, and I am the potter. Listen, don't read too much into that story. I'm not making a statement by reading that to you today. Don't transcribe that or transpose that onto our current setting. This was clearly written to an Old Testament Christian nation. This was written God's words directly to a specific people group in a specific time. So don't grab this and try to lay this in a corporate way over our world today. If you're familiar with this story, Jeremiah is instructed to go on to Jerusalem and smash a pot and say, listen, this is what I'm getting ready to do with your country as well. These are the words of the Lord. There are some uh, preachers that will probably take this and try to spin it up into a message for today's church. I won't go that far. This was not intended directly for us, but we read it by extension. And I would encourage you sometime today to go and read Jeremiah 18 and 19. Think about pottery. Think about being shaped in the potter's hands. Maybe don't apply that so much corporately to our nation, but apply it to your heart and think about that and ask yourself some tough questions. During this season, am I allowing myself to be shaped? Yeah. By media? By culture? Am I allowing myself to be shaped by God for his purposes, for his glory? What does he want to make of me? What is he creating out of me today? You might want to do some devotional time for yourself as you read through that passage later today. But let's keep talking about pottery, because you'll notice that pottery is an ancient symbol. It is. It's all through your Bible. Let me give you a few more examples. We can find this one in Psalm 22. It's kind of described here. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, a piece of broken pottery. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. So it's used as a bit of a metaphor there. Where else do we find this? Oh, in Job chapter 2, this story, perhaps you're familiar with this ancient story of the book of Job. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Joel took a piece of broken pottery, a potsherd that he probably found laying on the ground, and he scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. I think I might have some more on that one. Oh, no, I don't. Which begs the question, how prolific were these things? And how long had they been sitting around in the Holy Land? It's likely that the book of Job is one of the oldest books in our Bible. In my opinion, you would place this back to about the time of the patriarch Abraham, before the nation of Israel came into the Holy Land as a nation. This would be about 2,000 years before Paul is writing the letter that we're reading together today. And even at that time, it seems that there were pieces of broken pottery laying around for Job to pick up and scrape. These things are kind of everywhere. Um, when we were walking along in ancient Shiloh, actually, Dawn picked up a piece like this off the ground. They're everywhere. And she said, oh, my goodness, this one's kind of pretty. And then she tossed it down on the ground. And when she tossed it on the ground, it hit another piece of broken pottery. They're laying around everywhere. When you start digging around in Israel, you find these everywhere. You might even say that pottery was almost mundane. Yeah, it was everywhere in the near ancient east. There was even a gate that was named after it. Jeremiah was to take that pottery jar that the potter made. And what we read here, this is what the Lord says. Go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Take along some of the elders of the people and of the priests and go out to the valley of Ben Hinnom. The Hinnom Valley, outside of Jerusalem, near the entrance of the Potsherd Gate. So they had even named one of the gates around the old city of Jerusalem after Potsherds. Interesting note, I believe this is the gate that later became known as the Dung Gate. Does that mean what you think it means? Yep. It's because refuse from the city came out of that, 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 that uh, gate, including broken pieces of trash, like Potsherds. So a little clay jar should hold an appropriate amount of humility. They're almost mundane. But Paul places some value on these mundane pieces of earth. Why? Because of what they hold. 
our verse again. Let's look at that again. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and it's not from us. There's a treasure that's designed to live. If we're the jars of clay, it's designed to live inside of us. Let's be super clear. Let's ask the question, what is the treasure? Well, the treasure is definitely Jesus. And what's the jar? What holds this treasure? Well, me, you, us. The clay jars are meant to represent humility. We hold Jesus. That's a sacred trust, my friends. Don't take that responsibility lightly. You might say it this way, Jesus makes me valuable. He does. Not me in and of myself, but Jesus makes me value, a valuable. I hold the treasure. You hold the treasure. But I'm not designed to be the treasure. God is. I am designed to be useful. Jesus makes me useful. I, I want to show you. I want to show you that pot that you watched Dawn turn in that video just a moment ago. And I need to be careful because this is a bit fragile. This is actually the one that she turned just this past Thursday night. And so you can see that was kind of fresh. It's firm to the touch, but I've got to be careful with it because it's kind of fragile still. Pottery is useful. That's designed to be useful. I mean, one of these days after it's finished, I suppose a guy could put Captain Crunch in there and eat his cereal out of it. I wouldn't put that in there because Captain Crunch is gross and it cuts up the roof of your mouth. But it is designed to be useful, and one of these days that will be a useful pot. After, after it's been put through fire. Let me show you a chart. You probably can't read it from there. But if I wanted to eat Captain Crunch out of that, my cereal, one of these days, I would need to fire that bad boy somewhere, this is the Fahrenheit numbers, somewhere up around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And for a period of time, before that, a piece of dirt could become a useful tool. Pottery is useful after it's been fired. Before it's been fired, well... It's, let's call it what it is. I don't want to call it useless, but it's really just shaped dirt. I, I've got a funny story, actually. This was the second pot I uh, planned to use for this message. The first pot, just like it, was on a table in my office on Thursday. I was kind of playing through what I wanted to do and how I was going to preach this message, and it was sitting there, and I was working on something, and you guys have met Evan he uh, hosted the service today. He's our new worship pastor. I can't wait for this COVID weirdness to be done so you can get to know him better. Maybe have him over, he and his wife carrying their kids in your house to get him to know him better. They're great people. Evan is funny, genuinely funny. He came into my office on Thursday, and it was a moment of silliness, and I probably would have done the same thing. And he saw that pot sitting there, and he went to grab this useful pot. Not quite useful yet, because it hadn't been fired yet. He did not know that. You know where this story is going. He grabbed it, and he kind of made an action like he's going to throw it down, kind of fake like he'd break it, right? Except here's the problem. It broke in his hands. And then, like, he's still doing the motion. And then it, it, oh, it was one of those just moments. You had to be there. There's like a cloud of dust as it's billowing up afterwards. I did one of these. I was feeling for him in that moment. You can imagine the moment. Your new boss in his office. His wife has just made this, right? Oh, one of those moments. I wished I could have crawled in a hole with him as well. We've laughed about it since. We've all laughed about it. Don's sending him a funny text. Now it's become we poke fun and are having some silliness with it. But pots are useful after they're fired. Before that, well, they're not good for much. This is the pot I just described to you. It's kind of in broken pieces. And here's the deal. You could take this today and you could throw this out in my backyard. And if it rained a few times on these pieces, well, after a while, they would just become dirt. You can actually reclaim this. Dawn will do that. She'll throw it in a pot, and she'll put water in there. And I don't know what the formula is, but it ends up becoming mud again, and she can reform it into something useful. This is just shaped dirt. Why? Because it's not been through the fire yet. Pottery can endure after it's been fired. Let me show you some pottery that can endure. I picked these pieces up in a space called Sha'arim. It was a live archaeological dig. Oh my goodness, I was there a few years ago. 
they had already sorted through what was useful museum quality. And then uh, these are what were left behind for trash. And I picked this up. And that is a piece of a jar handle, probably a two-handled jar. You would hold it like this. And uh, I just wondered, maybe you could see there, and when you were looking at the close-up, there's still just a little bit of glaze left on there. And I just wonder, who held this pot 3,000 years ago before it was covered over by dirt? And now I get to hold it. This is a Bible story that was probably built up during King David's reign. And they just uncovered it in Israel. This was in dirt until very recently, just a couple years ago. What's the difference between this piece and these pieces? Again, throw these in my backyard, a couple rains, they're gone. These have endured for 3,000 years, and I suspect if you threw them in my backyard 3,000 years from now, you could dig them up then, and they would look similarly then. The difference is they've been through the fire. They've been battle-hardened. They've been tested, if you will. Listen, the whole world has been fired to some extent this past year. Jesus, people, hear me. What if, what if this is our time to shine? You've heard the phrase, hard times make hard men and hard women. And soft times, they make soft people. As a kid, I was fascinated by those stories when my grandparents told these stories of living through the Depression era. What if, what if God is doing some hardening of his people right now? What if we're going through the fire for a reason? What if he's got big plans in store for us, not just for us, not just for our posterity, but for Jesus? Let's invite Jesus to take all of this stuff that we've been living in. Now, there's a fancy word here. The word is redeem. Let's let him redeem this past year as we move forward. Let him use you towards something useful for his purposes because Jesus makes me useful the third and the final challenge from the text be encouraged and let me say this clearly don't give up be encouraged do not give up let's keep reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 let's read that passage again but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. If you're joining us online from home, I would encourage you to screenshot that image right now. Or maybe pull your phone out and take a picture of that. That's worth memorizing. That's worth holding on to. That's worth, as you think about your life as an investment for Jesus to be an earthen vessel that he's going to use, let that be your motivational speech, that locker room mid-halftime talk the coach is giving you. Here's the deal. Let's read it again. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, yeah, we've been struck down, but we are not destroyed. There's a beautiful juxtaposition in this verse. And I think it's apt for the day and the age that we're living through. Jesus, if you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus makes me powerful. Not just valuable, not just useful, but Jesus makes me powerful. We just read that passage. There's an all-surpassing power that comes from God. Paul picks up on this idea in Philippians chapter 4 when he says, I can do all things, right? I'm a vessel. I puff up my chest. I can do all things. No, that's not where that verse ends. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. If I've been th put through the fire, he can harden me, and he can make me useful, and he can do something beautiful with my life. Write this down in our weakness. His strength is beautifully revealed. Do you feel weak right now? Good. Because it's your weakness that gives space and room for his strength to be put on display. Let me show you some more pottery. I can't afford to show you one that's live in person because these things become almost priceless. Have you ever heard of kinsakuri? This is broken pottery that's been redeemed. 
because it's put together. Kinsakuri literally means to repair with gold. This is a centuries-old practice. I think it comes to us from Japan. It's the art of repairing pottery with gold or silver lacquer and understanding that the piece is more beautiful for having been broken. They put it back together with gold. And this becomes beauty from ashes. This becomes art from brokenness. This becomes healing from disaster. Do you feel broken? Good. Don't hide it. Put it on display. Celebrate it. Because, write this down, when you put your healed brokenness on display, you put Jesus on display. He's telling a story with your life. That Kinsakuri image you just looked at, the gold that holds the piece together, Jesus is the gold. When you put your healed brokenness on display, you put Jesus on display. This is how the Apostle Paul said it as we continue and we wrap up our passage that we're reading through right now. Chapter 4, verse 10, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Do you get what he's saying here? We walk around putting him on display. Our brokenness, ah, oh, he was broken. Have you read about his wounds and other passages that say by his wounds were healed? We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive and always being given over to the death for Jesus' sake. So that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So that death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Here's the question as we wrap things up today. How do we reveal the life of Jesus in our body? If we're jars of clay meant to be put on display for a world, we hold a treasure, how do we do that? I want to wrap up this with a challenge. Yeah, we're jars of clay. But remember, this is a letter that Paul is writing, and it's at least the second letter. It's probably the third letter that this group of people have received. You go back to one of the earlier letters. We know it as 1 Corinthians. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, there's this other metaphor about we. Right before the love chapter, the famous love chapter in chapter 13, we are the body of Christ. And then he uses the human body as a metaphor, an illustration. He says, the eyes can't say to the hand, maybe you've read this passage before, I don't need you. No, no, no. We are his body. And I just bet when they read this second letter and they said, oh, now, yeah, we're treasures, or rather we're jars of clay that are designed to hold Jesus that is the treasure. I bet those two metaphors came together in their minds. The body of Christ. Can I end today with a challenge? Those of you who are in the room right now, I love that you're here. It encourages me to spend time with you. I love worshiping together with you physically in the room. I love that you're here. But maybe you've noticed that many in our body are not with us right now. So those of you who are joining us online right now from a distance away in your living room, just kind of listen in to this encouragement. I'm going to talk to you specifically in just a minute. Those of us who are in the room, we miss you. We're jars of clay, right? The body of Christ. But I'm tempted to think of it being fractured right now. Pieces. You're here. Some of us aren't here. Could I encourage you right now? On your way out today, we've got a table sitting right over here. My family, my wife and my kids had fun a couple days ago smashing up some pottery with a hammer. And there's a broken piece that's there for you. You can pick out your own on the way out. It's designed, well, to kind of put an emphasis on this message today. Maybe there's a takeaway. You walk away and you think, yeah, I want to be reminded of that over the next couple of weeks. Could I encourage you to put some significance on that broken piece of pottery as well? Put it someplace in your house this week and pray when you see it. Pray for our church body. Pray for the global body of Christ. Feels broken right now but not shattered, right? Pray the passage that we just read over your brothers and sisters that are joining us from home right now. You pray for them when you see this. Put it somewhere in your house that will remind you to pray this prayer. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side but not crushed. Perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. Take that with you. Pray that prayer. 
those of you who are joining us from home, I'm so glad that you're with us. You heard Evan say something at the beginning of the message about maybe scanning that QR code. Or maybe you can go to, uh, where's our passage? Yeah, adventurechristian.church slash card if you go there. By the way, this is so important every week that you fill that out. Because we want to track with you. And we want to know what you're going through. And you can even share a prayer request there with us. Do that right now. If you have not done that yet, please fill that. Because here's the thing. We want to send you one of these as well. This Wednesday, our staff's going to gather together. We do it every Wednesday morning. We call it 9 at 9. And we want to pray for you. And we're going to pray over these uh, pieces of pottery. And we're going to send you one in the mail so you can expect to receive it by the end of the week. We want to pray over you, and we want to remind you that we miss you and that you are a part of a larger collective here. Some of you, some of you might be thinking right now, yeah, I'm missing this space. I'm missing these people. I'm missing feeling and recognizing that I'm a part of a larger body of Christ. Some of you are already telling me stories about you can't wait for the round of shots, the vaccinations that you're getting ready to take because you're counting down the days for you to get back here to church. I love hearing that. Some of you are thinking, I don't want to wait till the end of the week. I don't want to be reminded right now that my church loves me, that they're praying for me. Here's the deal. If that's you, if this just stirred up something inside you and you want to know that somebody's praying for you right now today, do me a favor. Shoot me an email. Do it soon, over the next couple of hours. Dawn and I have planned the rest of our day. We'd love to drive to you. If I just describe you and you don't want to wait till the end of the week, I would love to drive you one of these. So shoot me an email. Stan at VentureChristian.Church. Just send me an email there. Give me your address. But more than that, give me your specific prayer request. And as we drive to your place today to deliver this to you, we'll do as many of them as we can. We'll be praying for you specifically and lifting up that specific request that you share with me right now. Because I want to remind you that you're a part of something that's much bigger. You're a part of the body of Christ. We might be broken vessels, but God wants to use us in big ways because we hold his treasure. Would you do me a favor, if you're in the room, would you stand up with me right now? I want to pray, and then we're going to continue in worship. Father in heaven, I thank you for the reminder that you're God. I thank you for the reminder that you are the treasure. We're a vessel. We might be broken, but Lord, you knit us together, and it's... (laughs) From our brokenness, your beauty can shine through. So, Lord, as we sing songs of praise to you right now, as we pour our hearts out before you, God, we show you, we share with you some of our brokenness. And we ask you to redeem us, to heal us, to knit us back together, even on the inside. Hear our prayers as we sing them to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen.